Roswell Flight Test Crew on our way to Pendleton, Oregon for the Fall AUVSI Cascade Chapter Conference. We want to see how the pros do it. Our adventure began with a 200 mile drive east from Portland through the scenic Columbia River Gorge. The first day of the conference was held at the Wild Horse Resort and Casino. Eric Folkstad, president of the AUVSI Cascade Chapter, told us about his organization and the event. AUVSI stands for the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. It's a mouthful. Well, the Cascade Chapter covers Oregon and Washington primarily. So we do one event uh, per year in Oregon and another event per year in Washington State. Typically, most people know about the military applications for unmanned systems, you know, the Predator, the Scan Eagle, and so forth, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. The event today, our primary focus is on more commercial applications. Uh, precision agriculture is a big one. And we've had speakers come in from around the country here to Pendleton to uh, bring us up to speed on what's going on in Precision Ag. It's very exciting. Also, wildland firefighting is a big area. Uh, we tragically lost 19 firefighters in Prescott, Arizona this uh, spring in a horrible tragedy. We're trying to figure out a way where unmanned systems can be used to prevent that type of tragedy in the future. Young Kim of Bosch Precision Agriculture gave a great presentation about the use of small unmanned aircraft systems in farming. We caught up with him after his talk. The unique dynamic of agriculture is a very, very economics driven business. So if you can do well in ag, show up at, at a farm site, deploy the unmanned system, take the aerial imagery, process it, and then provide intelligible information or actionable uh, information to the farmer in a cost-effective, timely way, that skill set actually becomes a competitive skill set for you to go into other industries. And, and, and as I mentioned about ag, it's such a large industry that if you focus on that and generate the company and generate the revenue from that business, that gives you the foothold and the cushion, if you will, that allows you to invest for the long haul in pursuing some of the firefighting applications. Right. So the FAA's primary concern is safety. So if you're gonna pick an application, if the FAA has a desire to open up the airspace, but wanna do it in a sequential, safe manner and do incremental steps, I propose that agriculture is a very good first step because one, from a safety perspective, these UAVs operate in the most benign environment. Uh, it's in Class G airspace, which means it's by definition in rural areas that's sparsely, if any, uh, population there. It's flown at fairly low altitudes with very small vehicles per se, and, in, uh, and I propose starting off with 50 pounds or less. You can get away with a decent platform that's 25 pounds or less. And so there's really no polarizing issues of privacy and those type of issues. And, 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 and most importantly, it makes a huge economic impact or can make a huge economic impact to the farming community. So you put a safe banana environment, huge economic impact, a, a, a very small UAV platform, and all that to me comes together in saying if FAA is looking for that first application, agriculture seems to have the necessary ingredient. We also heard from Jason Ramos, a smoke jumper who described what it's like to parachute into the middle of a forest fire and how a portable short-range SUAS could help him do his job. You know, I love flight, so it's a hobby first, uh, but there are so many things and so many pluses that we could save time uh, putting these, these folks on the ground in hazards and we can do it with a unmanned system within minutes versus a lot of money within days. And it's been proven. The day ended with an overview of the current Federal Aviation Administration policy regarding UAS. All of the hobbyists out there are totally fine to continue enjoying the love of the sport. Below 400 feet, within line of sight, outside of populated areas, away from airports, um, as, as specified and I'm sure you all know out there. Uh, in terms of being able to do this professionally, yeah, we're incrementing towards that. And um, I, I, anybody's guess how many years it'll be, but I think you'll see, I think you'll see probably something in the uncontrolled airspace areas and farming. Um, I think you'll see the FAA allow for some 
some kind of increment there next. They, they keep signaling that. Uh, nobody knows exactly what form that'll take, but it's probably going to be similar to the line of sight below a certain altitude rules. Yeah, we have a long way to go, the bottom line. The FAA's shown their, their attempt to show compliance with the regulations by allowing the Puma and the Scandi to get type certification this year. Um, that was the first step, and it, that's a good positive sign, but the reality is they were still very controlled and very limited in what was allowed to occur. Um, it's going to be a while before we see real in national aerospace integration, and it's unfortunate. I mean, it, as, as you've seen from a lot of the briefs today, uh, there's a lot of great technology coming forward. There's a lot of interest in developing agricultural applications, firefighting, a lot of great humanitarian uses for the technology, um, but we're still burned by a bureaucracy that is, that is frustrating everyone. And, and during the breaks, we had the opportunity to check out the displays set up at the back of the room. The following day, the conference moved to the Army National Guard base at the Eastern Oregon Regional Airport. The base commander shared with us the unique role his base played in one of the most daring raids of World War II. In 1941, the Department of the Army made this airfield and they called it Pendleton Army Airfield and the Army Air Corps operated out of here for a number of years during the war. Uh, the 17th Bombardment Group of the Army Air Corps was uh, just an Air Corps bombardment group, but almost every one of the Doolittle Raiders was a volunteer from the 17th Bombardment Group. You're uh, standing in a, in a pretty history-rich place right now, so we welcome everyone. We're really glad you're here. Along with several other multi-rotor pilots, we had the opportunity to show off the capabilities of our aircraft. Now, as I was saying, we've had the opportunity to work with uh, local fire departments, search and rescue teams, and other outfits like that. Now, one question I kept getting asked over and over again yesterday was, hobbyists, what's your angle? How are you monetizing that? And um, the question is, we're not. We really, truly are hobbyists. But the giant plus that gives us is we get to play with this technology with no COA as long as we adhere to Advisory Circular 9157. So we hope, we think that's giving us the opportunity to be a test bed for how this technology is going to be used once you all, once all you find people develop it in the future, and also to um, to hopefully make people aware that it's not a threat, that they don't need to be concerned that drones are spying on them. So that's our mission, and if there's ever anything we can do to help any of you by providing a perfectly legal aerial platform to test something or do something, we're here for you. So thanks very much. Several aircraft were on display, including a full-sized fixed-wing platform capable of operating in either a manned or unmanned capacity. This is a DA-42 MPP made by Diamond Aircraft in uh, Wiener Neustadt, Austria, um, and it's designed to carry sensors and be a sensor-centric airplane. And it's, it can be both manned and unmanned? Uh, correct, yes. There's a surrogate option for this airplane where uh, you buy it as a manned airplane and we can drop a kit in and convert it to an unmanned uh, platform. Wow. And they say it's, a, it's for sensors. What kind of sensors can it carry and what sort of missions does it perform? Uh, we can carry uh, sensors for doing mapping, for doing uh, border security, uh, doing sporting events, live news feeds. Uh, and so it's, it's capable of doing multiple types of things, uh, maritime patrol as well. In the guard's maintenance hangar, we had the opportunity to see a unique, lighter-than-air SUAS designed specifically to serve as a camera platform. The airship is designed for you know a number of different tasks. The big advantage is that we can go vertically, uh, up or down, and have greater control pretty much than anything that flies. Uh, it is a lighter than aircraft, so you know people think of balloons and blimps. This can have much more control, but still have the station keeping ability. What gave you the idea of doing this? 
Uh, biomimetics, watching uh, fish, looking at nature. I actually witnessed uh, a salmon about a foot and a half long come out from behind a rock in the river. The second salmon came up right behind him and used his tail, put his head right next to the tail and like two race cars drafting, they hung out for just a moment and then they put their side flippers in and shot up river without using tail movement, just their body shape. So there's kind of a eureka moment that we could take that shape, stretch it vertically, make an airfoil. So that was our trip to Pendleton, Oregon. Hope you're watching. See you next time. All right, fly safe.